morning. Today we will discuss a hot topic in clinical practice, which is a step from adequate to optimum hemodynamics. We would ask questions about the current adequacy of hemodialysis and what we should do more for our patients to have optimum hemodialysis. We all know that currently KT over V is the practical and the official according to guidelines, reimbursements in different countries toward adequacy parameters is to measure KT over V or the urea reduction ratio. Both of them belong to very small solid, which is a urea. Current adequacy did not touch any of the middle molecules. Also, it didn't touch the ultrafiltration rate applied to patients. While you can reach an adequate hemodialysis and still the dialysis session time is short using bigger dialyzers, very fast blood flow, you can have adequate KT over V. But still, you are far from optimum hemodialysis. So, in this talk, we will focus on the negative aspect of KT over V and some points of improvement of hemodialysis therapy depending on our knowledge on the uremic toxins, the results of many studies on the mortality, health related quality of life, and the outcome of our patients for the cardiovascular diseases. So, before going to points of this talk, we can ask ourselves, are we doing adequate hemodialysis? Are we satisfied by these parameters of adequacy? Do you see your patient as healthy as in renal transplant or in the general population by three times per week hemodialysis sessions. Can the patient have a job in between? Post-dialysis fatigue is additional point ask your patients, are you feel better after hemodialysis and after how many hours you feel good? The agenda for this talk will be introduction to CKD current adequacy in hemodialysis, steps for optimization, the quality incentive program, improving the hemodialysis membrane, identifying more uremic toxins with currently involved in the cardiovascular diseases and rule of inflammation. So before going to the talk, we have to define that what is adequate hemodialysis. Question to be addressed, you should ask yourself, what is the definition of adequate hemodialysis? 
And do you agree it is good to achieve a patient therapy or not? And if you believe in that, so identify your experience. And if you don't believe in that, please ask yourself why is it still currently adequate hemodialysis parameters is on the guidelines. So before going to the adequacy parameters, a CKD is an unending journey. While going from stage 1 to stage 5 CKD hemodialysis, patient may go directly for hemodialysis as incentive patients, then awaiting for renal transplantation or patient of CKD may go to primitive transplantation and if has no enough luck, he will return back to the journey of hemodialysis. So CKD is an unending journey. Migrating from CKD5 HED to transplantation or the reverse is the only curative way and preventive strategy is the optimum for dialysis patients. However, failure to find optimum therapy in hemodialysis opened the door for professional cheatings. The paramedical point in patients with CKD, a lot of paramedical medications, and majority play on the feelings of patients to avoid dialysis while it is a must in end-stage renal disease. The association of dialysis duration with outcome after transplantation in the Japanese cohort identify that primitive kidney transplantation could be beneficial for the death with functioning graft or graft loss or on patients post-transplant cardiovascular disease meaning that hemodialysis current technique is considered a risk of inflammation and or immune modulation. While adequacy is achieved, still hemodialysis technique carry a risk of inflammation. The diagram of inadequacy of hemodialysis is multifactorial and each step should be reviewed. We will focus on how is the failure of therapy is due to adequacy assessment or inpatient treatment. Now, what is optimal hemodialysis? Ask yourself what you feel that optimal hemodialysis should be. In two single words, optimal hemodialysis definition should improve the healthy related quality of life, as in patients with renal transplantation at least, as well decrease the mortality rate. You need to move from a good structure of hemodialysis units to a process of hemodialysis with different hemodialysis techniques and safety measures, then finally, what is the accurate measured outcome, not only for the mortality, but also for the comorbidity associated. The intensive hemodialysis can positively address a health-related quality of life comparing to renal transplant patients. Prolonged hemodialysis, as in nocturnal one, can improve the physical function, improving the patient well-being, improving the post-hemodialysis recovery time, how many hours the patients feel tired after each single hemodialysis session, and the overall score of comorbidity. So the health-related quality of life between nocturnal and prolonged hemodialysis and renal transplantation could be comparable. 
However, short sessions of hemodialysis is associated with negative outcome. So the agenda will go for the current adequacy in hemodialysis. The current adequacy is a standard KT over V. And while if you calculate that on basis of body surface area, you will find that women and the small patients weight are currently under dialyzed. However, still KT over V urea, an official marker of adequacy in between genders and in between big and small weighted patients. Also, KT over V did not describe the accumulation of microbiota derived uremic toxins, the middle molecules, which is included in the vasculopathy and inhibitions of nitric oxides, thromboses, and activation of platelets. So, KT over V should be a mean, not a goal. It is not only the way to assess the adequacy of patients, it is just a starting point to assess your patient adequacy of hemodialysis. We call it adequate when the mortality rate of patients who are adequately treated is 25%, which is worse than most of cancers. So optimum hemodialysis is a moving target to improve the current mortality rate in patients on dialysis. Adequate hemodialysis within one year, you will lose 20% at least from your patients. And by five years, almost 60% will die. Identifying patients at more at risk with comorbidities will improve the survival. The KT over V, a magical formula for dialysis ad adequacy, on this clinical review, the results reveal that KT over V is not the best criteria and cannot be assured of dialysis adequacy based solely on that. So you need more markers besides the KT over V. KT over V did not apply to gender differences. And KT over V, K of what? Of urea, which is very small solids and over the volume of the distribution, which varies between genders and weight of the patients. While T is the only small letter, still it is the important one. We have to stress on the time of the dialysis session, the length of the dialysis session. So it should be like that. Increasing the time is the most important one. Keep your patients on a longer dialysis session is the most important one in adequacy of hemodialysis. Don't go for shorter dialysis session with very fast blood flow, bigger dialyzer, and you will find huge rebound after that. Only at least four hours is required per each dialysis session. In order to move from adequate to optimum hemodialysis, 14 points is required. You should have normalized blood pressure with minimal or no antihypertensive, normalized calcium phosphate product without phosphate binders, absence of intradialytic symptoms such as hypotension cramps, and nausea, absence of interdialytic symptoms, patient can have a job and works fine, no interference with ability to hold the job, protein appetite is good, control of uremic toxins and the middle molecules, no dialysis related or access related hospitalization, 
neither alcotic nor acidotic, no evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy, no evidence of amyloidosis, long preservation of residual kidney function, life expectancy, approximately that of living related donor transplant, improves the survival of patients on hemodialysis, and systemic inflammation near normal. For the Japanese hemodialysis patients, a low KT overview was found in women and patients with a blood flow rate below 200 ml per minute and the treatment time below 4 hours per session. So in order to have an adequate hemodialysis per se, before going to an optimum one, the slower, the more gentle, the longer, and the more frequent dialysis treatment is the better. Urea and chronic kidney disease, the comeback of the century. So the kinetics of urea are not representative of the kinetics of several other uremic retention solids. And that all urea cannot be held responsible for all complex metabolic and the clinical changes responsible for the uremic syndrome. However, urea still remains valid. Why KT over V say nothing? Because KT over V of urea, it's an only small molecules, no middle molecules clearance, differ between females and males, and difference between small and bigger patients, no markers of protein energy wasting, did not describe different comorbidities, and adequate KT over V will have a low hemodialysis product. We will discuss what is hemodialysis product. So, KT over V is typically the elephant in the room. We all know that it is not enough for assessing adequacy, but it still remains valid. We know that this obvious problem or risk that no one wants to discuss, and why our survival rates are so poor when supposedly adequate dialysis is being achieved in terms of KT over V alone. calling for optimization of hemodialysis. If your patients ask you, can I do optimal hemodialysis, not just adequate? So you have to mention steps for optimum one, and you can calculate how many points you achieved for optimal hemodialysis and what is needed further. Game changers for the concept of dialysis adequacy not only for small water soluble compounds going to middle molecules probably you can remove more protein bound toxins preservation of the kidney function and dialysis with amiprene larger pools can do hemodial filtration and improve the diet of your patients according to the latest publication from the CDC, the dialysis safety approach. You need also to control infection. You have to do clinician education. You have to be adherent more or less to the guidelines. You have to talk to your patients and give him enough information and data reporting for analysis and the improving on the outcome. In this stage, renal disease, the quality incentive program should be applied. The quality incentive program is to promote high quality service in outpatient dialysis facilities treating patients with end stage renal disease. The quality incentive program has many scores, at least 10 points should be weighed. KT over V, 
vascular access type, bloodstream infection, standardized readmission ratio for patients, blood transfusions, hypercalcemia, how many patients in your unit has hypercalcemia, mineral bone diseases, serum phosphorus and PTH, anemia management, how many patients reaching the target of hemoglobin, pain assessment, and the depression score. So the quality incentive program scoring is based on multiple factors put in one patient to assess his current disease condition and how much of care you are supporting your patients, not only from the adequacy point of view regarding the KT over V, but also the vascular access type and other parameters are important as the adequacy parameters. The end-stage renal disease quality incentive program rules needs continuous quality improvement effort. You have transparency and robust public reporting, identifying coverage and payment decisions, what is the incentives in hemodialysis payments, and what should be covered in these payment incentives. The Centers for Medicare and the Medicare Service Dialysis identify the five stars hospitals and centers by clinical measures, safety measures, and the reporting measures with different weight. For example, you can have clinical measures in the 75%, safety measures for infection control and other 15% and 10% for reporting. And this reporting is important for dialysis patients in order to have interpretation and to know the center what he achieved and what is the progress of improvement it is. So the total performance score depend on the clinical measures safety measures and the reporting measures. Example of the clinical measures like adequacy, vascular access type, hypercalcemia, safety dialysis events, bacteria in blood streams, and reporting of each single data on your patients. The payments 2018 Reduction will apply to facility according to the following chart. How much achieved? Comparing a unit performance with other dialysis units. Improvement compares a unit performance to their previous year performance. And weighing 90% for the clinical and safety and 10% for the reporting. Without reporting, we will not find an interpretation of the current state of patient's modality of treatment and what is the outcome. So, we can have it here, clinical performance, we are doing our best in clinical, but without reporting, there is no enough data for interpretations from different center and center and to study the comorbidities and what is the moving points for an optimal hemodialysis. The clinical measurements could be as reported like that. How many patients with arteriovenous fistula or casters? How many patients have an adequate KT over V? How many patients have hypercalcemia? Who of them have bloodstream infection or recurrent hospitalizations or have any blood transfusions. So the overall is approached on the clinical background based on many of the clinical measures during hemodialysis. The structure of hemodialysis unit is important because at least 10 points should be fulfilled in each dialysis unit. You need administration room, educational room, waiting room, nutritional support, social support, technician and nursing rooms, meeting rooms to discuss 
each individual patient at risk. We are also encouraging transplantations, clinics, and the PD training program. Or you may have to advise your patients for home hemodialysis. Home hemodialysis has been shown that it improves the survival with lower mortality risk, more convenient, more prolonged, controlling better the hypertension, left ventricular mass, and reported higher quality of life. And the overall outcome of patients did not stop on adequacy. You need more simultaneous evaluation of multiple risk factors for hemodialysis patients. The combined dialysis risk factors could be as low serum albumin for the nutritional, low body mass index, high C-reactive protein for infection, inflammations, as well other parameters of adequacy. So you can put your patients at risk. This could reduce the mortality in patients on conventional hemodialysis. So from adequacy to optimum hemodialysis, from payment per dialysis treatment, you may go to payment per treatment hour, encouraging centers to prolong the dialysis session time. Or you can calculate the hemodialysis product, which is how long the dialysis session in hours multiplied by the frequency of sessions per week. It basically sounds does not depend on fake lab test, patient can monitor when he feels better. The best achieved hemodialysis product is 72. If you put your patient on 8 hours hemodialysis for 3 times per week, while conventional hemodialysis is 4 hours 3 times per week, the hemodialysis product will only be 36. If you're going to inadequate hemodialysis, more if you're going for the still the same dialysis session, the same incentives, the same payment, but you're still going to for the patient only three hours of hemodialysis, which is quite not enough for the majority of hemodialysis patients. Only the time factor is important, plus the frequency of hemodialysis. From the DOPS study, many markers of survival have been identified, including the time, more prolonged time, is associated with better survival, Serum phosphorus has U-shaped pattern. High serum phosphor is associated with higher mortality and as well lower serum phosphorus because it defines the nutritional status of the patient. So it is a U-shaped. Optimal serum phosphorus is in the middle. Also serum magnesium, which is rarely checked in our patients, had been shown that low serum magnesium is associated with several complications such as hypertension and vascular calcification, and also associated with increased risk for both cardiovascular disease and non-cardiovascular disease. So it is therefore advised to measure magnesium more frequently. Vascular access. Vascular access outcome reporting and maintenance hemodialysis in a systemic review. Still, the evidence remains in support of autogenous access as the best approach when feasible.
in the Dobson study, in modern centers like in Japan, the majority having arteriovenous fistula. The castor rate had been decreased. However, in some other countries, the castor is still very high. And the better outcome for arteriovenous fistula. One additional point, where is the arteriovenous fistula? Is it proximal or distal? The best to have a distal arteriovenous fistula. While in countries increasing the proximal arteriovenous fistula raises the question of whether this practice shift may place patients at greater risk because exhausting available sites for future arteriovenous fistula creation. So better to start with the distal forearm arteriovenous fistula before jumping directly to a proximal one and exhaust all the na native veins of the patients. Don't be aware and afraid from arteriovenous fistula increased cardiac risk. Sometimes nephrologists are afraid from doing arteriovenous fistula. In this review, a high output cardiac failure has been shown to be more common if the fistula flow greater than 2 liters per minute or in a patient with high ca output cardiac failure, meaning that the vascular access flow is 30% of the total cardiac output. The vascular access type differs in the elderly people. In one study shown that elderly people have more reported failure of the fistula and are more dependent on a central caster. Going to the graft has higher hospitalization or infection. So in the elderly people the access type, if started with a native arteriovenous fistula, the possibility to move to caster is high and are more longer central venous caster dependent. But we have to start with arterial venous fistula if available and if you have venous mapping of the patient's veins suitable to do arterial venous fistula. So, in conclusion, for the elderly patient who underwent arteriovenous fistula placement, had longer catheter dependency but a lower likelihood of death than those who, who underwent an arteriovenous graft placement. So, the second choice for elderly is doing native arteriovenous fistula and put a catheter if it's necessary to do. Awake functioning arterial venous fistula as a start of hemodialysis journey in patients starting the hemodialysis session has the lowest burden with a film arterial venous fistula or central venous caster axis is associated with the highest burden.
In this second part, we will talk about the hemodialysis membranes for the physiochemical structure and how we can improve the biocompatibility structure, which means blood membrane content. So basically, the hemodialysis membrane means that different fluxes which determine the solid or toxin to be removed according to the molecular weight, ultrafiltration coefficient that determine how much water is removed per each transmembrane pressure applied, and most importantly as well, the blood membrane contact. Most of hemodialysis membrane now is called asymmetrical membrane. With synthetic membranes having the internal porosity smaller than the outer porosity. Contacting the blood with the inner surface of the membrane can induce severe reaction, can induce thrombogenicity, can induce immune reactions, and it could be transmitted to the patient's blood. While the outer surface protects the patient from current water impurities, and improving the water impurities should be in all dialysis modalities. However, some synthetic membranes can have more protection by absorption of the endotoxins inside the thickness of the membrane. Polysulfur membrane remains a golden standard for the maximum protection by absorbing the endotoxins coming from the dialysate impurities. While a long distance which carries the blood from the patient to, to the fibers inside the lumen, where the solid flux move from inside to outside the fibers. The meaning of flux meaning that the porosity of the membrane can remove solutes with a definite molecular weight while low flux only remove very small solids, medium flux and the high flux and the super flux is three different additional membrane depending on how much the molecular weight could be removed. In the conventional high flux membranes, the beta-2 microglobulin molecule could be removed easily while in superflux or what's called expanded hemodialysis membrane can remove bigger molecule but unfortunately albumin will be lost as well. So hemodialysis membranes consist of asymmetrical structure with a backbone of polysulfone which is completely hydrophobic and an internal skin layer, which is the saving layer that determines which solids can pass. This diagram showing that this is the blood membrane interaction and contact. And this is the skin layer or the saving layer of the membrane. while the resting part of the fiber thickness is the backbone. So the internal skin layer, sieving layer, is only one micro, while the resting is the backbone of the polysulfone membrane. The inner skin layer should be smooth as an endothelium because any roughness facing the bloodstream during hemodialysis will induce platelet and coagulation activation. So usually, in most of the current dialyzers in practice, have hydrogel-like structures, PVP paste, which is that this is the hydrophilic nature of the membrane and incorporated inside the polysulfur membrane and some other membranes. And this PVP paste, polysulfone hydrogel formations, 
makes a smooth inside the membrane. Hemodialysis can induce thrombogenicity and immune reaction. So we have to avoid. For the functionality, we can classify the dialyzer into five classes, depending on beta-2 microglobulin clearance, while the class 1 or low flux and the high flux or super flux, and this is the range of how much beta-2 could be removed. Working with high flux and super flux can improve the dialysis quality because you can remove middle molecules. Not only the small one, but the middle molecules could be also removed freely, while the protein pound toxins is hardly removed because it's carried by albumin and the membrane is not leaky to the albumin. So flux and permeability with a cut-off meaning that what is the maximum molecular weight could be removed? And this is the molecular weight of majority of toxins. If you go here, for the high flux membrane can remove up to 20,000 to 30,000 according to the membrane permeability. Going beyond the 30,000 need more porous membranes like mid-cut-off membranes. While in plasma separation therapy, plasma filters can remove up to 2 million molecular weight. So this is a target to be removed in the future with higher molecular weight uromic toxins that is triple the size of the beta-2 microglobe. Blood membrane content. The blood membrane Road, meaning that whenever the blood flow through the fibers is in direct contact with the inner surface of the membrane, how much is this distance? Is it around 3,000 kilometers in four hours? Let me explain that. This is a blood pathway dialyzer, if we put the fiber together in the same line, it is 3 km distance and the blood flow at a QP 300 ml per minute passes the dialyzer in only 15 seconds. So, blood contact is 3 km contacting every 15 seconds. The total blood membrane contact in one single session is 3,000 kilometers. So blood contact can activate system immunity, thrombogenicity, and it can transfer pyrogen from the dialysate. Considering the thrombogenicity, with hemodialysis membrane, contact of the blood can induce platelet activation, coagulation caskets, and formation of fibrin mesh. So if any kind of roughness of the dialysis membrane, the blood contact will induce thrombogenicity by activation of platelet, coagulation, and formation of fibrin mesh. It is not defined only for the blood membrane, because during dialysis session, the blood returned to the patient returned activated by the complement pathway induce severe adhesion molecule, activations, coagulations, and inflammatory response. So it is not defined only to the membrane interaction, but while transferring the blood from the filters to the bloodstream back again can induce severe immunological and coagulations activation. So in thrombogenicity, we have complement activation, protein adsorption, coagulation activation with contact with surface, protein changes, activation of cells, recruited platelets, and catalyzed fibrin formations. And back again to the circulation 
activation during hemodialysis session can induce contact activation, augmentation of thrombosis, transfer to the patient bloodstream, to the endothelium, causing atheroma and calcification. The uremic toxins molecules is hardly defined because you need four steps approach to define a specific uremic toxin. The uremic toxin should be chemically identified, laboratory or proteomics analysis, and their levels in the uremic patients should be higher than in normal persons. And this uremic toxin should be clearly identified as a cause of the disease. And the disease should be improved by their removal. So, according to many hundreds of uremic solids retained in the blood, you cannot approve that it can cause the disease because you need the four steps approach to define a uremic toxin. In recent publications, a lot of uremic toxin solids have been identified and all are in the range above 10,000 Dalton. Those molecules are removed only by either the high flux membrane or the hemodia filtration. The molecular weight had been expanded to beyond 30,000 Dalton as well. And this is more than double size of beta 2 microglobulin. With the advances in hemodialysis membrane, still a huge number of molecules beyond 30,000 could not be achieved by current techniques. You can find that FVG F23, vasoactive intestinal peptides, inflammatory mediators like pentraxins, advanced glycation in the products, and like chains. We can classify it into four major groups. The group called cytokines. can augment the amyloidosis and can induce severe endothelial damage. Please read the document here because each molecule from the cytokine can induce different approach for the endothelial damage. Also can induce severe protein energy wasting with sarcopenia and anorexia. Second group is the adipokine and different types of adipokines have been identified and it carries a pro-inflammatory cytokines effect. The third group is the immune mediated proteins. which can induce overactivity of complement system and inhibit leukocyte, chemotaxis, apoptosis, and function. And finally, the growth factors, which can be contributed to the cardiomyopathy, cardiac hypertrophy. There is integration of the four groups cytokine, adipokine, immune modulators, and growth factors in the development of atherosclerosis in patients on regular hemodialysis. So, involvement of large middle molecules with cardiovascular disease, the cytokine promotes for atherosclerotic plagues, inflammatory response, prothrombotic effects with 
severe impairment of nitric oxide production, the most potent vasodilators, advanced glycation end products, deposition within vessel wall, induction of oxidative stress and inflammation as well, atiponectin, expression of adhesion molecules, while growth factors can induce cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. All of those can induce a chronic inflammatory reaction inside the blood. This can lead to cardiovascular effect, kidney disease progressions, protein energy wasting, CKD, MPD, as well anemia and insulin resistance. So the protein energy wasting in patients on dialysis are important to be judged clinically and laboratory. You can assess simply by very simple equation, which is the urea creatinine ratio. A clear association between elevated urea creatinine ratio and increased risk for all cause mortality, infection related death, and the incidence of coronary heart disease. A higher urea creatinine ratio may indicate a lower creatinine level, resulting from diminished muscle mass in sarcopenic patients. And it's related to all cause mortality, coronary heart disease, and infection related disease. While going from the ratio above 7, you have an extreme risk of death. The urea creatinine ratio showed a positive correlation with serum C reactive protein level and the protein catabolic rate, while it's correlated negatively with nutritional indicators such as serum albumin and the body mass index. Insulin-like growth factor 1 as assessment tool for protein energy wasting in different dialysis modality. We studied that and showed that in high flux dialysis, you have a better insulin growth factor 1. Also, the online HDF was studied for the DNA methylation and induxyl sulfate removal. We found that with online HDF, you have a better DNA demethylation effect. So, online HDF can improve the DNA methylation caused by uramic toxins, in particular the protein pound, while the induxyl sulfate, one of the protein pound uramic toxin, could not be removed effectively by online HDF. So HDF can improve the DNA methylation while still the protein pound uramic toxins could not be removed efficiently. Importantly, DNA methylation improvement is a dose dependent on the convection volume. So you need higher convection volume to improve the DNA methylation effect of your image. An example of beta-2 microglobulin amyloidosis as a model of retention inflammation. In hemodialysis, we have a retention molecule of beta-2 microglobulin. But it's still removed effectively by high flux dialysis. However, the level of pre-dialysis level of low flux versus high flux is comparable, meaning that Beta-2 microglobulin increase after the session of hemodialysis back again exactly like urea and creatinine, so could not explain solely by removal rate. In high flux and hemodial filtration, you remove beta-2 microglobulin 
as well cytokines, so improving the deposition in the joints. A complementary removal of cytokine in high flux and the hemodiafiltration modalities improve the beta-2 microglobin amyloidosis in patients on dialysis. So, the pathogenesis of beta-2 microglobin in hemodialysis patients with the deposition and the accumulation in the cervical discs as well in the vascular wall and synovium, this associated increase in advanced glycation in the products, cytokine in synovium, and increased expression of matrix metalloproteinases, causing destructive changes of the bone and cartilage. So elevated levels of cytokines play a major role in the pathogenesis of beta-2 microglobin amyloidosis and joint destruction by inflammations, cytokine production, and augmentation of expression of HLA class 1 agent can induce much more production of beta-2 microglobin. So we have to avoid inflammation during hemodialysis, especially by using ultra-pure dialysate. So the dialysis-related amyloid osteoarthropathy with active osteoclastic bone resorption and synovial tissue destruction. There is inflammatory cells infiltrating the synovium, preparing the joint for beta-2 microglobin deposition. On the hemodial filtration latest results from the DOPS, the overall percent of hemodial filtration in Europe is around 23%. However, only 50% of patients can reach a convection volume more than 20 liters. Hemodial filtration subjected Patients were more for the dialysis-related amyloidosis, polyneuropathy, patients with hemodynamic instability, patients on long vintage on hemodialysis, heart failure, diabetics, and the elderly. With the post-dilution, hemodiafiltration is that in the majority of cases. You can use larger surface area dialyzers, and this improves the hemodiafiltration therapy. Surface area beyond 2.0 can improve the quality of hemodiafiltration, and increasing QF to maximum will increase the membrane fouling and the convection failure. So it's probably patient who achieved high convection volume needs bigger dialyzers. In many studies that support the hypothesis that high convection volume can positively impact on the protein hypercatabolic state of hemodialysis patients. So online hemodialysis filtration compared with high flux may contribute to preservation lean body mass, stabilized protein and fat stores, increase protein intake and reduce inflammation by removing complementary cytokines during sessions. Although the effectiveness of hemodial filtration is still unclear in many of literatures, using hemodialysis with a medium cut-off membranes, you have higher clearance and higher albumin loss. Compared to high flux hemodialysis and hemodial filtration, medium cut off can remove effectively as on hemodial filtration, but on the expenses of few grams of albumin loss. For the molecules beyond the beta 2 microglobin, expanded hemodialysis can remove effectively as in hemodial filtration, the myoglobin and above. So, in better improvement of our understanding of adequacy, what's beyond the V? 
So we can rescale additional parameters for KT to normalize protein catapelic ratio, body surface area, energy expenditures, and total energy expenditures. The importance here is to compare patients, gender states, and weight, as well activity. So, three factors here are important. The different in genders, the different in weight, and the different in activity of the patients. So, in sedentary peoples may not require very intensive dialysis like an active one. And the small males and females, it's better to divide KT over the body surface area, not on the V. With rescaling for women, they will have enough dialysis of KT over body surface area. You can calculate the body surface area or directly from the table, or you can calculate it online. Rescaling for small patients as well improve the adequacy of hemodialysis if you divide the KT over body surface area. And this table shows that the difference in every item, if you divide KT over V or KT alone over body surface area and total energy in expenditure or normalized protein catabolic ratio. So the delta changes here define how much you need for more adequate hemodialysis if you compare additional KT over additional factors rather than KT over V. So optimal dialysis prescription, we have to understand and know what we don't know up till now. Comfortable, better control of blood pressure, anemia, CKD, MPD, better control of uremic toxins and the volume state, and our goal is better survival and health-related quality of life. You need high permeable membrane, high flux, more prolonged time, and more frequency every other day dialysis at least. In conclusion, a well-defined difference between adequate versus optimal hemodialysis. New advances in hemodialysis is still running in the hemodialysis membranes, rather a well-fixed therapy of vascular access type, hemodialysis type, frequency, ultrafiltration rate, and other goals of therapy for mineral bone disease, blood pressure control, cardiovascular disease, assessment, anemia control. Do we settle for adequate dialysis or push for optimal one? Thank you very much.